we're going to go right back to this airbrush painting tutorial from where we left off in last week's video. In the first part, I talked about some of the anatomy within the portrait. So this time we're just going to be focusing on the skin textures and how to paint this facial hair, how to paint the beard. So let's get right back into this one. Like always, my completed painting as a reference is on the left side of the screen and the tutorial is going to be on the right. The first thing I'm doing here is using a transparent orange just right out of the bottle and spraying a very thin glaze of this over the area that I just worked into. I was starting to notice that some of the flesh tones were starting to look a little bit too desaturated. So to add some saturation, just a thin, thin glaze of some orange over the top. I'm holding my airbrush pretty far away to do this six to eight inches back just to dust on the thinnest layer of that paint. Just bump up the hue a little bit. Once that layer is down, I want to start right underneath the eye and use my eraser to start pulling out some highlights. If you look at my completed painting, you'll see that in between these wrinkles right here on the area that I'm circling, there's some bright areas. Some light is hitting the higher parts. So while paying attention to that reference, I'm using my eraser to pull out a few of the highlights in between the shadows, in between the folds of skin. You can see what that does, just erasing some of that paint makes this area lighter. You're not removing all of it, just a, a small amount. And now the areas in between the wrinkles start to look like they're raised up a little bit. We're getting that illusion to make it look like wrinkles. The raised area looks closer to us, and then the shadows look like they're deeper and farther away. And I'm also adding a gradient with this eraser. A gradient just means a transition from a darker value to a lighter value. And to do this with an eraser, it's pretty simple. I just erase out an even value of paint in the area that I want to highlight. And then to add the gradient, I'll just use more pressure where I want the area to be lighter. And then as I move into the shadow, I use less pressure. And that's the thing that I really love about this Createx illustration paint. It's the only paint that I've ever used that really allows me to, to paint like I'm drawing. And of course, this isn't any sort of promotion with the brand. I have no connection with them. I just, I love it because it really feels like you're working with graphite, you know, with a pencil or with charcoal. The only difference is that you just need a little bit more pressure to erase into the paint using an ink eraser. I want this wrinkle here to look like it's a little bit farther back, so I'll use the flesh tone. This is the cooler version, and I'll start spraying it into this shadow again. A little bit of randomness and some few dots will just help add to that texture as well. There's a few wrinkles just below this area that are moving down vertically, so I'll take this ripped piece of paper and line it up with my initial drawing. You can see that I don't spray the whole wrinkle in one shot. I just kind of move the piece of paper around and spray little bits at a time, just letting them connect. And this is the same thing that I'm always talking about with regular shields. They're never going to fit a curve perfectly, but if you just kind of adjust them and move them around, spray small parts at a time, you could really get them to fit almost anywhere. So the same thing goes with wrinkles. That ripped piece of paper you're using is not going to fit the wrinkle perfectly. So just adjust it, move it around, spray small bits, and you can get it to fit. So let's slow this video back down to real time, and let's just paint this one wrinkle and talk about the highlights to the left and to the right of it. When I ripped off this piece of paper, I try to rip a few different angles in it. It's kind of like a, a very subtle S curve. And I'm using the convex part of it right here to line up with this edge of this wrinkle and then lightly spraying the lighter and uh, warmer flesh tone over the top. So now we have this soft jagged line painted in, but it doesn't look like a wrinkle yet. And that's because we only have the shadow of the wrinkle painted in. That crease is going to act as the shadow. And now we're going to need some brighter areas, some highlights around it. I'll be using my eraser, so what I need to do is just lay down a very thin amount of paint, which I'm doing now. The airbrush is pretty far away, about 8 inches, maybe 10 inches away. I'm just lightly dusting that paint on. I wanted to add some more definition into that wrinkle, so right back over to a ripped piece of paper, and I sprayed on a little bit more paint here to darken it up. I also want to extend this wrinkle farther down the face, so I'll just move that ripped piece of paper down and then continue spraying over it. I might have sprayed it a bit too dark, but that's no big deal. We could adjust it later on with the eraser. So this is the area that I want to focus on right now. We have that dark wrinkle right down the center, and then to the left and to the right of it, we have some highlights. So before I start erasing, I'm using the airbrush freehand with that lighter flesh tone, the warmer one, and I'm just spraying in some texture. And when I sprayed this in, you'll notice that I didn't spray too much texture where the highlight is going to be. It's going to be in this area right here that I'm circling. So I'm just kind of leaving that blank so when I erase, I don't have to erase out too much paint. And by leaving it blank, I'm talking about the skin texture itself. There is, of course, some paint there because that's going to allow me to erase into it. But I just don't want some dark dots in there because that's a lot more difficult to erase than a thin layer of paint. After that paint's down, I'll start on the left side here and then start working my way over to the right. And you can just see I'm just reworking into these areas, lightening them up, and while I'm doing that, I'm also adding texture. 
I added a few more wrinkles underneath and these are just going to be reference points for me so I can kind of use that to judge where these highlights are going to start and where they're going to stop. The first area that I want to work into with the eraser is right underneath that dark shadow. The highlight here is pretty thin so I'm just erasing it out left to right. Underneath here, instead of using small circular motions like I usually do, I'm just going to erase out some diagonal shapes. And there's no particular reason for this, I just kind of figured that it would add some interest, add some randomness into this area instead of having the same pattern all the way across. So you can see here that I'm just kind of like sketching with this eraser into this area. Some diagonals and some vertical lines, kind of overlapping them to make that texture look a little bit more even. I notice that there's another highlight to the left of the one that I just added in. So I'm just going to the left side of that wrinkle and doing the same thing, pulling it out. When you're working with an eraser like this, it can be kind of fun just to play around and try to get different types of textures. You'll notice here that I'm erasing out in a bunch of different motions. A lot of diagonals, vertical and horizontal lines, but I'm also adding in some small circular motions. Basically anything that starts to look interesting to me and starts to feel like a skin tone. When I'm painting, I'm not all that interested in trying to copy every single thing I see. I know that some people are. I think that's a great thing. But what I'm interested in is just to try to show the feeling of what I see. So for example, if we take something like skin texture, what type of tools or techniques can I use to try to get across what I'm seeing? And so for me personally, sometimes that means a bit of exaggeration and sometimes it means adding more subtlety. Whether or not these techniques are effective isn't really that important to me because we're all going to have different preferences for what we want to see in our paintings and in others. But the thing that is important to me is to try to do it the best I possibly can. And then when I finish the painting and look at all the techniques together as a completed whole painting, I can decide whether I like them or not. So let's go back into this area and start pulling out this highlight. I want to start closest to that crease, to that fold just above it. You can see that my eraser comes to a pretty sharp point. I just use an electric pencil sharpener for that. And what's nice about it is it just helps me get into these small areas, to those tight thin lines where I need to pull out some paint. And then while I'm erasing, just like I was talking about before, different strokes, up, down, left, right, diagonal, and just trying to let them overlap so it doesn't look like a bunch of little lines. Make it look like an even layer of highlight pulled out. Now let's take a look at my completed painting on the left side of the screen. And we're looking in that area that I talked about last week in between the zygomatic bone and the maxillary, right on the cheek. What I want to do here is simplify the idea within this painting just by looking at the values and the transitions between them. The values in any painting and the location of them are going to set the planes, meaning the shapes of everything you see. And if those values are too dark or too light or the location of them is off, the portrait is going to look like a different person. So what I did here was to set up a sphere in Photoshop using the values and the hues from this portrait. This way I could show you a simplified version of that illusion in painting because it really is an illusion. This sphere is showing the values within this part of the portrait. You can see that the highlights or the brighter parts are up top and to the left and then the shadows are down to the bottom and to the right. So if we look at the shape on the right side of the screen, we're all going to see it as a sphere. Meaning that the illusion that's going on is that we're interpreting this like a 3D shape, even though it's not. It's a flat two dimensional image that you're seeing on your screen, but because of that lighting, meaning the values and the transitions between those values, we interpret it as three dimensional. And now if I remove those highlights, the lights and darks, and the transitions between them, suddenly the exact same shape appears flat. Since there are no gradients within this shape, our brains interpret it as a two-dimensional circle rather than a 3D sphere. Now going back to the same shape with the gradient, the highlight on top, and the shadow on the bottom, this is exactly what's going on with this part of the portrait. It's setting the planes of both the highlight of the cheek, the transition point, the midtone, and then the shadow. And this is what I like to think of as the major values or the macro values within painting. These large values, these masses of light and dark are going to set all those shapes to make your portrait look like the person that you're trying to paint. And so in that area that we just painted, those wrinkles and folds in the skin, that's what I like to think of as the small or micro values of a portrait. And those micro values set the shapes of the small things in portraits like wrinkles, bumps in the skin, or even something like pores. Or another way to think of it is that the micro values create the texture in the portrait. So going back to the wrinkles and folds that we painted a few minutes ago, the values, meaning the highlights and shadows of these wrinkles, make up the micro values of the skin texture. And then if we think of the portrait as a whole, the major values that set all those planes, 
these textures are within the highlight of the cheek, so within the highlight of the major value of the cheek. And in representational paintings like what we're doing here, major values are everything. They're really going to make up 90% of what you see. The small micro values or textures can just add some interest in those major values. And so I don't know if that's helpful to you, but that's one of the ways that I've always thought about it and just kind of simplified it for myself. My major goal is always to get those major values in as closely as I can to the reference or to what I'm seeing, because again, those are going to set the planes of everything we're seeing. It's going to make the portrait look like the person that we're trying to paint, you know, the cheeks, the forehead, the nose, the mouth. And then within the smaller or micro values, that's where I like to have some fun and just experiment, play around with different techniques, colors, and textures. So now as I work my way down the cheek, that's exactly what I'm doing and what I'm thinking about. I'm using the same flesh tone mixtures that I showed in last week's video, but on this part of the cheek where it's in shadow, I'm using the cooler version. That cooler, darker version just helps to get these values darker quicker. But now one thing you'll see me doing here is that after I get that down and then add some texture into it, I'm using the smallest amount of some black paint. This is that over-reduced black paint that I talked about in last week's video. And then I just lightly glaze it over that darker, cooler flesh tone mixture. Very, very small amount because the black is really going to kill the color in here, which is what I was going for within the shadow. And you can see an example of that right here on the right side of this cheek. I'm using that cooler flesh tone mixture to add in the values and using my eraser to pull out some of the texture. And even though it's a cooler version of the other flesh tone, it is still a flesh tone, so it's always going to have that reddish orange color to it. So right here, I'll go over to that transparent black paint, that over-reduced color, and lightly spray it into the shadow. Light amount is the key. And you can clearly see the result of what we get from spraying that over the top. It desaturates the color and it also darkens it up. And now to finish up this video, I'm going to show you how to paint in some of the facial hair and the beard using drawing techniques. I'm using that over-reduced black paint to spray some of that down into this area. There's going to be a lot of hairs here, meaning a lot of shadows underneath, so the black tone is going to work better for me than using a flesh tone. You could, of course, use the cooler flesh tone here. That'll work just fine, but the black is going to go a little bit quicker for me. So now to start pulling out these hairs, I'm using an X-Acto blade. This is a number 11, and you can see what I'm doing, just scratching into the paint line by line. The surface that I'm painting on is 15 ounce cotton duck canvas with a fair amount of gesso on it. It's a very, very tough surface. You could use as much pressure as you want with the blade, you're not going to damage it. The paint removes very easily on a smooth canvas, but if you want an easier way of doing this, a synthetic paper like Yupo actually pulls off much, much easier. Either option is just fine. I prefer canvas because I could soft erase into the paint a lot easier. It's not all or nothing like some of the synthetics, and also it's something that you don't need to frame like you do with paper. So once I get down a few hairs, I go right back over to that transparent black paint and then just spray it over the top. You can see I'm even doing this a little bit messy. Doesn't matter much to me. I just want to get down some paint. For the left side, for the profile underneath the nose, I'll use a shield and just lightly spray some of that paint over to the right to set that shape in. I'll be scratching over the top of this so the edge doesn't really matter too much. Just try not to spray this too dark. Just remember that it's always easier to remove a small amount of paint that hasn't had time to dry than it is to remove a lot of paint that's cured. And then right back over to the X-Acto blade to add on another layer. And then I'm just going to keep doing this. It's rinse and repeat over and over again. One thing that I do like to do is to work pretty quickly with this. Just try to get some randomness within these hairs, you know, not to have them all lined up perfectly. And this is something you're just going to have to play around with until you get comfortable with it. It's not difficult to do, and you could actually adjust the line width by the angle that you hold the X-Acto blade. So I'll speed through some of this because it's the exact same thing over and over again of adding down paint, scratching into it, and then adding some more on top. And if you just keep building up layers like what I'm doing here, you could really build some depth in that facial hair. So now just one quick tip, in order for the paint to remove effectively, you need to be painting this on a smooth surface like a synthetic paper, something like Yupo, or what I'm working on, a smooth canvas that I set up myself. And the other thing is a paint that has a very weak binder to it, like I'm using Createx illustration colors here. But the other one that I used to love is Comart paints. I think they were discontinued recently, which is a shame because that was a pretty decent paint. And finally, it's easiest to remove paint when it's freshly placed on there, you know, within the hour of spraying it. But even if you wait a long time and allow it to fully cure, let's say a week later, you could still remove the paint. It's just going to be a bit more difficult. So that's going to be it for this week's video. I hope you enjoyed some of these tips to help you out in your portrait painting.
Keep on working, keep on practicing, and really try to enjoy the time that you spend painting. One way that you can make portrait painting a lot more enjoyable is by picking a subject close to you. A family member, a friend, or even a portrait of a pet, one of your animals. It's just going to make it feel a lot more important to you and special when you complete it. There are things and people in this world that only you know well, so paint pictures about those things. Paint what you feel is worthwhile and true. But above all else, just keep on painting. So that's going to be it for this one. Thank you all so much for watching. I'll see you back here next week. But before I go, I just want to say thank you so much to the generous support of the channel members who really help keep this channel going. So thank you all so very much and have a great week.